Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. We welcome you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. This is Preacher Edward speaking right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. We're hoping you and the radio listen audience are enjoying the program as it's coming on the air. I'm sure you here in the church will enjoy what we have lined up for you. My Bible is now open at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, page 1216, in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I want you to turn there, would you please, and follow me in the scriptures, and I appreciate it so very much. Now remember the service this evening is 6. I want you to be here at 6 this evening for the evening service. If you're not getting our daily broadcast, I want you to tune in and get the broadcast each day at 12 o'clock noon. And you get it Monday through Saturday. Now the message and the music today, of course the singing will be on tape number 316. You can write in and get this tape for a gift of $3 to be used to help defray our radio expense. And I'd like for you to write to me. I'm in need of hearing from you in the listening audience. I'm going to speak, be speaking today on the fate of the drunkard. The fate of the drunkard. I hope that you'll Listen to this message, and then you write it and get it on cassette tape because it can be very helpful. Probably having an alcohol problem in your home, this will help you, I'm sure. While you're writing in, if you'd like to request the charts put out by Brother Lewis and Brother Getty, you can get them free of charge by writing to my address and requesting them. Good Bible charts will help you understand the Word of God. So you turn now to 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when you please. You know, I'm glad we had a jury that had backbone enough to place old Carl Isaacs and, and old Jack Potts back on their seat on death row, although they'll be sitting there for years to come unless they break out and the taxpayers will have to pay their bill or pay for them and look after them, care for them, and uh, foot their bills. They said old Isaac could be sitting there from five to nine years yet in the future, and we have one of the most shameful judicial systems that's in the world, I'm sure. It's, it stinks. Look to me like we'd have some politicians that have intelligence enough to try to do something about it. Those two men should have been put to death years and years ago. But instead of that, the loved ones of the people they killed having to pay their tax to put their bills to keep them on death row, Others on death row been sitting there for years. And I don't know who in the world set up this stinking, rotten, shameful, criminal judicial system we have in America today. But every time you talk to a politician, oh, we're against crime. We're going to do something about it. And then they get elected and do nothing about it. It's a shame and a disgrace. Those three stooges that call themselves judges that, uh, overthrew or overturned the death penalty on Carl Isaac. I hope they're happy today after making the all-day family uh, suffer and go through the anguish in which they did. Cost the taxpayer uh, thousands of dollars. Even old Jack Potts' expense was 70000 And those uh, crime lovers that overturned those convictions, those liberals, uh, beloved, they, they ought to have to pay the bill. They ought to be have to pay every dime of it. And they should be impeached, especially those three that don't have sense enough getting out of the rain that overturned the death penalty of Carl Isaacs. That's a shame. That's a pity. It's, it's pitiful. And 99.5% of all people in the United States of America are against what they did and don't believe in the crime loving. I don't know. They may have been bribed. I don't know. I. I don't look to me like not having uh, any feeling for the family, any consideration for the taxpayer, and I, I, of course, already crowded, and then to overturn that death penalty. I don't know uh, if they, why they did it. I don't see how they could have done it unless they were bribed. I'm not saying they were, but unless something, they had to be mighty, mighty unconcerned, don't care, crime loving and stupid to do a thing like that. Now, I know a lot of people don't like what I'm saying, but I don't care. I, I'm stirred up. I'm concerned about the law-abiding citizen here in America. 
I'm tired of seeing our innocent people being killed and uh, preachers shot in their study and people robbed and, and people that operate uh, their business being killed and shot down like dogs and these robbers getting away with it. I, I, I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. And it disturbs me greatly. It's getting worse. And that's why I cry aloud and spare not. And I want to get something stirred up and get the people concerned to put pressure on these spineless politicians that could do something about it and get them to do something about it. And if you don't, you may be the next one shot down like a dog. Your wife or daughter may be the next one raped. Beloved, you may be the next one robbed because uh, they, they stop punishing criminals. We're not punishing criminals anymore. You may say, now preach Edwards, what should be done about the man that commits cold-blooded murder like Jack Potts or Carl Isaac? The Bible said, put him to death. Don't play around about it, put him to death. They admitted the crime. They know they're guilty. Why keep trying them and overturning the thing? That's stupid. Put them to death. They should have done that after the first trial in a matter of just a few weeks. Oh, how pitiful. How pitiful, how sad our criminal judicial system is in America. I'm ashamed of it. We have a lot of good judges, a lot of good lawyers that's ashamed of it too. And the American citizens are ashamed of it. It's a disgrace in the eyes of the world. And something needs to be done about it, whether you like what I say about it or not. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, Post Office Box 501, Athens, Georgia, 30603 is the zip code number. If you want to write to me, that's all right. If you want to call me, that's all right. If you want to come to see me, that's all right. I'd be glad to look you in the eyes and tell you exactly how I feel about it. I have conviction, and what I say is based on the Word of God. I stand on the Bible as long as God gives me breath to do so. I don't care what people think about it. And you know I'm telling you the truth. These liberals and infidels don't like it. They know I'm telling the truth. I am telling the truth. Now, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. This is tape number 316. And if you'd like to have it, you can get it. Verse 9. Know you not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, now abuses themselves with mankind, and that's you homosexuals, your sex perverts there. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you're washed, but you're sanctified, but you're justified in the name of the Lord Jesus, and by the Spirit of our God. Now that's reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. You have some people that say the Bible doesn't say anything about drunkenness, doesn't say anything about alcoholic beverages, about drinking, but you just don't know your Bible. You ought to read your Bible. There's many, many verses that condemns alcoholic beverages in the Word of God, and you need to know about it. There's a monster loose today in the land called Liquid Devil. Causing our nations to come at the foundation. Our society to come apart at the seams. Our homes becoming a place of unrest. And our highways becoming a slaughter pen. There's some 27,000 people killed in America every day because of drunks. One out of every two automobiles you meet today on the highway, they say, the man under the steering wheel either has in his system beer, wine, liquor, or drugs. Now you think about that. You never know when he's going to switch over on your side of the road and hit you head on. Because in his system, every two drivers, in his system, you're going to find beer, you'll find wine, you'll find liquor, or you'll find drugs. And so you better keep your eyes open, be on the alert, because these drunks are killing people at the rate of 27,000 a year. More than 50,000 wrecks by drunks and 27,000 deaths. That is something to think about. We're living in a drunken nation. There's more booze drinking, understand, in Washington, D.C. per person than any other city in the world of its size. You need to keep that in mind. When you have more booze drinking in Washington, D.C., where they operate and run this nation, then that's something very serious. 
The governor says we'll sell it for the revenue. Every time you talk about uh, voting out whiskey, uh, not having whiskey in certain places, you got these liquor heads and beer bellies and the liberal crowd, they'll jump up and say, now wait a minute, when we get conventions coming in here, they want something to drink. Well, let them drink milk, water. There's plenty of things they can drink outside of liquor. If you have to pour liquor in the stomach of these liquor heads that come into these conventions, we don't need them. Let them stay where they live. We don't need them. Don't need them in our city, Athens, Georgia, or Atlanta, or any other place. If a liquor is going to keep them coming in or keep them from uh, keeping them out, then we don't need that kind of people. We got too much liquor drinking today. And whenever you have conv uh, conventions of anything worthwhile, then you don't need a bunch of drunks sitting there trying to hold a convention. You need the level-headed men, men and women that can understand and reason and plan and figure out things that need to be done. Now let's take a look at a few things at what happened to some of the drunkards in the Bible. There's a lot of things happened to some drunkards in the Bible. You may say, preach, I didn't know that. Well, you ought to read Genesis chapter 9. Verses 21 and 25, and see what happened to Noah when he got drunk on wine. See what happened to him. A curse came on his descendants. There's a curse placed on Cain and his grandson, and that curse remains on his descendants today, all because old man Noah, after God had been so good to him, he pitched a drunk, and his son saw him naked in his tent. And I won't go into further details about it because of mixed audience. But a terrible thing happened, and a curse came upon his descendants. You go to old drunken Nabal in 1 Samuel chapter 25. Had one of the most beautiful and lovely wives that ever lived. And he was a drunk. I feel sorry for any woman that has a husband that's a drunkard. If she's a good, kind, decent, law-abiding woman, Christian woman, has to live with a drunk, I feel sorry for it. For her, there's multitudes today that's having to live with drunken husbands. I mean people that you what you call alcoholics, but the Bible calls them drunkards. The Bible said they'll not inherit the kingdom of heaven. I feel sorry for them. The way they started out, no doubt, is by drinking their beer. You have a lot of people, they got to have that beer. Put that beer in the refrigerator. If they go on a trip, got to take some beer. If they have a party, got to have beer. If you talk to some of these poor old drunkards, and they say, how did you get started? They say, I started out on beer, began to drink wine, then liquor, then maybe dope. They never intended to become drunkards. They never intended in their minds to fill a drunkard's grave and a, a drunkard's hell. Never intended to do that. But that's the way they started. Oh, you say, preach Edwards, what should we do? Be a total abstainer. Don't drink any beer. Don't drink any wine. Don't drink any hard liquor. Lay off of all kind of dope and, and have a clean mind and live a clean life. That's what God tells you to do in this book, and that's what God expects you to do. There's multitudes of drunks. A man called me the other day and said, Preacher, I'm, I'm an alcoholic. He didn't say he was a drunkard, but that's what the poor fellow was. He said, I'm an alcoholic, and I'd give anything in the world if I could get some help. Preacher, is there anything you can say or do that would help me? And he said, I've tried everything, and, and, and Preacher, I just don't know uh, what to do about it. And I said, God can help you if you're willing to help yourself. Now, you've got to be willing to help yourself. You must be willing to say no to the bottle and be willing to help yourself, and God will help you. If you'll say, no, I'm not going to drink anymore, get down on your knees, repent of your sins, ask God to forgive you, get up and walk straight, and don't touch that strong drink, you can overcome it. It'll take a man to do it. It'll take a woman to do it. Just anybody is not going to do it. You're going to have to be a real man if you do a thing like that because it's going to be hard to do, but it can be done. Many have done it. Old ungodly Bill Shares had died in a drunken stupor in his banquet hall many years ago with a dagger in his back and lost his kingdom. Now, what will drinking do for you really physically? According to the Bible, it'll take away your heart. In Hosea chapter 4 and verse 11, Wherefore wine and new wine take away the heart. Many a man has killed his loved one, killed his precious wife, killed his children because of drunkenness. I have clippings right here. Uh, where a man um, uh, went in drunk one night and he and his wife got in the fuss about him coming in drinking. They had a precious little child that came up with his little arms up and uh, wanting daddy to take it and love it. 
Daddy reached down, picked it up by his heels and bust his brains out over an iron stove. And whenever he sobered up, they, he said, I didn't realize what I was doing. He said, I was drinking. I was drunk. I wouldn't have done that for anything in the world. Another man is, came in drunk and, and uh, she had several children, she and her husband. And they, he, they began to fuss and, and then um, his, his wife grabbed a butcher knife and he did. Going to attack her, she managed to get a hold of the butcher knife and had the butcher knife in her hands. He made a dive toward her and that butcher knife penetrated into his heart. He fell down drunk and went to a drunkard's grave in a drunkard's hell. That poor woman grieved. She said, I didn't intend to kill my husband. I didn't intend to kill my, the father of my children. But it happened that way. He was attacking me and attacking the children and ran into the butcher knife. And it penetrated into his heart. Came in in a drunken stupor. Many years ago during the Korean War, a soldier came home, having been, hadn't been home in years, lived in the state of Virginia. And in California, he called his mother and dad. They're so excited, they could hardly behave themselves. He said, I'll be in as soon as I can get there. He arrived in Atlanta, called him again, said, Mother, Daddy, I can't wait to see you. They said, Son, we can't wait to see you. We haven't seen you in years. We're waiting for you. We just fixed your, your special food, what you like. Cook the kind of cake you love. Mother and Daddy, be waiting for you. Open up. Oh, he said, I can't hardly wait. He left Atlanta, came down to Stone Mountain, a drunk drove out of a side road, run a stop sign, hit that car, killed that young soldier right on the spot. What the communists could not do in Korea, the liquor crowd did it in America. Left that mother and dad with a broken heart and a young son had to pull his body out of a crushed automobile, died wanting to go home to see his mother and daddy. And the drunkards, they took care of him. The communists couldn't get him, but the drunkards took care of him here in America. And the drunks today are causing great and untold damage in our homes, in our towns today. Many homes broken up, many little children deprived of what they um, need to eat and clothes they need to wear. I've seen people pull into beer joints and beer dives and liquor stores, and I'm not throwing off on the kind of car they drive, bless their hearts. If that's the best they got, well and good. But I've seen them drive in there, an old shackle automobile, just about ready to fall to pieces and buy a load of armful of beer, lick and wine, and drive home in that old rattle trap and have their lick and beer and wine to drink when they could take that money and buy food for their children, buy clothes for their children, educate their children and buy them maybe better transportation than what they have because they spend their money for booze and don't care about how they neglect their family, their wife, and their children. Now, drinking liquor causes you to mistreat your wife. Many of a good woman's been mistreated and abused because of a drunken husband. It'll make you mistreat your children. It'll send your parents to a premature grave. I know mothers and dads today that died with a broken heart over a drunken son our drunken daughter. Quite often I get calls or letters from mothers that say, Preach Edwards, will you please pray for my daughter? She's in her teens and she's drinking and she's on drugs and we can't do anything with the preacher. It's breaking our heart. I've had them call me and say, Preach Edwards, our son, our wayward son, he's so rebellious and he's drinking and he's on the, uh, drugs and what can we do about it? We just broken hearted. I'll tell you, crushes your heart when of loving and kind parents that's been good to their children and the children come up and get on the bottle and begin to rebel against their parents. It'll cause you to curse the God that created you. It leads you to strife. In Proverbs chapter 23, verses 29 and 30, Who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath contentions, who hath babblings, who hath wounds without cause, who hath redness of eyes, they that tear long at the wine, they that go to seek uh, uh, mixed drink, the Bible tells us. It'll ensure you into poverty. In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 21, For the drunken and the glutton shall come to poverty, and drowsiness shall close a man with rags. Beloved, remember, It'll take money that you need to survive on. I've known a businessman, good businessman, intelligent businessman, make good in business, begin to hit the bottle, and the first thing you know, they're broke. They've lost everything they have because of the bottle. 
maybe lost their good wife, maybe uh, caused their children to fall in their footsteps and become drunkards. It's a shame. I've known dads that start out drunkards, the youngins come along. I know a man right today, he hit the bottle, became an alcoholic, had two sons to die drunk, alcoholics. Oh, God help us today. We need to realize the man that carries the booze into his home is setting a bad example. The man that buys the stuff is helping to support it. You good men, you listen to me, you should not have any kind of alcoholic beverages in your house whatsoever. You shouldn't have it there for your children to see and maybe to, to drink when you're not around. We need to realize that. There was a young girl one time going to uh, celebrate her uh, graduation one Sunday afternoon and, and she and her boyfriend was going to ride around and, and she just graduated from high school and they wanted to celebrate it. And so they went out to celebrate their, their graduation from high school and they had a wreck and they were killed in the wreck and, and they found when they tested them, they found they were drunk, both the young boy and the young girl. Her daddy went into a rage. Her daddy said, if I could find, if I could find the person that sold my lovely, beautiful daughter that liquor, I could take my bare hands and crush his life out if I could lay my hands on him. He is very embittered that after the burial, he went to his uh, closet uh, to get a little drink himself out of his bottle. And he picked that bottle up and there was a note on that bottle that said, Daddy, I'm sure you wouldn't mind, you know, we're celebrating our graduation. And so uh, I thought I'd take some, some of your whiskey along and so we could, my boyfriend and I could drink and enjoy it. And there she just about took all he had in his bottle and she got drunk and they got killed. And he said, if I could find the person that sold my daughter that whiskey, I could take my bare hands and put him to death. And he was a very man himself that did it. He never forgave himself because he knew he was guilty. He was responsible for putting his dear daughter to death. He had the liquor there and she carried it with her and they got drunk. We find another case of disgrace and shame because of whiskey. Not only was Noah disgraced and his family disgraced because of what took place in Genesis chapter 9, but we find in, in Genesis chapter 19, another man by the name of Lot, his daughters got him drunk, and you know the story. Beloved, listen to me, shameful and disgraceful, all because of alcohol. What did God say about drunkenness anyway? The Bible says in Isaiah chapter 28 and verse 1, Woe to the crowd of pride, to the drunkards of Ephraim, whose glorious beauty is a fading leaf, which are on the head of the fat banners of them that are overcome with wine. He's saying that you fade like a leaf, like a beautiful flower fading when you get involved in alcohol. You young people, you ought to be a total abstainer. You ought to say no. No whiskey is going down my throat. No alcoholic beverages is going down my throat. No, no. I'm not going to smoke pot. I'm not going to get on dope. No, no, not me. I'll stay clean. I'll stay pure. I'll keep a healthy body. And maybe God let you live a long time on the earth. Many of a person in the graveyard today, they're there by the hundreds of thousands because of alcohol and because of dope. The Bible says in Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth a bottle to him, and maketh him drunken. Also thou mayest look upon their nakedness. What is God said? What does that word woe mean? That word woe means a curse. Curse is the man that puts his bottle to his neighbor's lips. It's a dangerous thing to give your neighbor whiskey or alcoholic beverages. It's a dangerous thing to have any part in it whatsoever. If you sell it, if you make it, if you distribute it, if you rent your building for it to be sold in, if you have any part in it whatsoever, then God is going to hold you responsible. It's a dangerous thing. Many years ago, there's a couple of boys from Athens. I don't remember their names. I remember what happened. They were coming down the mountains in North Georgia, and they had a truck loaded with beer. They were beer peddlers carrying beer around from one place to another. They were coming down that mountain road and cutting up and carrying on, and all of a sudden, they lost control of that truck and down into the valley it went and into a tree, and it caught on fire. 
And the neighbors heard them. They said, we never heard such terrible screams all the days of our life. They were heard come those two young boys that were crushed in that truck and couldn't get out. And it caught on fire and they burned to death. They screamed, they cried, they prayed until the fire burned them to death. And they could pray no more. Those two boys came from the city of Athens. Beloved, listen to me. It's a dangerous thing to have any part whatsoever in regard to alcoholic beverages. God plainly tells us so in the Bible. You go ahead and rebel against God and God's word, you're going to pay the price. As certain as I'm talking to you here this morning, don't put the bottle to your neighbor's lips. Beloved, the man that uses a friend drink, the man that makes it, the man that sells it, the man that hauls it, the man that goes to the counter and sells it over the counter, the man that rents his building for it to be used, the man that advertises all of this, God said, you're going to be held accountable. You're having a part in putting the bottle to your neighbor's lips. You need to realize that. Yonder in Germany a few years ago, that was a major that thought maybe he'd go out and get some booze for his soldiers. They had been good men. He wanted to do them a favor. And he went out and brought in some booze. And they started drinking party. And one of those soldiers turned and killed the sergeant. Shot him in the back. Didn't like him. Got drunk and killed him. And they held that major responsible. And he was responsible. He was a major. He was in charge of those troops. And he went out and bought the liquor. And he's just as guilty of killing that sergeant as the young soldier that killed him in a drunken condition. What you do in your drunkenness is no excuse. You know better. If you go out here on the highway in a drunken condition, get in your automobile, drive down the highway, and you have a wreck and kill somebody, you're guilty of killing a person. You knew better. You knew you shouldn't get under that stern wheel drinking. If you get under that stern wheel with beer, liquor, wine in your body, and you have a wreck, and it's your fault, and you kill somebody, you have killed somebody. Oh, you say, now, I, I was drinking. Well, that makes no difference. You knew better anyway. You don't fool God. God knows you were, you're guilty. You shouldn't have drank in the first place. You may go before some of these judges and lawyers and whatnot and say, well, I was drinking. If I hadn't been half drunk, I wouldn't have done it. If I don't know what I was doing, I wouldn't have done it. That's no excuse. That's no excuse before a holy God. That doesn't bring back the man you killed on the highway. You knew better than to drink that stuff and get in your automobile. Gasoline and liquor will not mix. Gasoline and alcohol will not mix. Dope and alcohol will not mix. And you can't mix it and get on this road and be innocent. You kill somebody, you're guilty. You got their blood on your hands and it'll be there until the judgment day. You put that man in the grave, you might as well took a gun and shot him because you knew better in the first place to drink and drive. Remember what I said at the beginning of this message? Did you know about one half of all the cars you meet on the roads today? About half of them either got beer, wine, liquor, or drugs in their body. Did you know that? That's why so many drunks are killing people on the highways. Did you realize 27,000 people killed every year in America because of drunken driving? You know why you're having to pay so much insurance on your automobile? It's because of the drunk and drunken drivers in America and teenagers running wild and having wrecks. That's why God help us today. God will hold us responsible. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 1, Wine is a mark of strong drink is raging, and who's ever deceived thereby is not wise. God said, you're not wise if you become enslaved by alcohol. Oh, you say, preach, I, I just got to have it. God says, you're dumb. God says, you're not wise. If you're not wise, then you're dumb. Beloved, if you get hooked on alcohol, you have played the dumbbell. You, you should know known better to start with. I feel sorry for you. God help you. You should have never started drinking in the first place. I had an uncle. Came out of World War II, never saw a sober day, and I preached his funeral at the age of 44. Killed himself drinking liquor. That was a pitiful sight. He'd go to bed at night and have a bottle sitting beside his bed all during the night. He'd reach over and get that bottle. He'd go on his job and have a little, little container, and they thought he was carrying coffee or tea or water to work. He had it full of liquor, and he drank it all day long on the job, and he died. Beloved, he drank enough liquor, beer, and wine, as the old sin goes, to float a battleship. 
fine, handsome young man. We played together, grew up together, and he was just a little older than I am. But liquor got him, chain smoking got him, and he died. God help us. It breaks our hearts to see people get involved in alcoholic beverages. You don't have to drink it. Nobody makes you drink it. You, know, you shouldn't drink it. You shouldn't buy it. You shouldn't spend money for it. The money you spend for beer, wine, and liquor can be used for a good cause, and you need to save it and use it for a good cause to take care of your family. God help you to realize that, and God will hold you responsible. Wine is a marker. It'll mark you when you spend all your money and you're broke. It'll mock you when you get into trouble. A lot of people in jail, they said, oh, I wouldn't have done it. If I hadn't been drinking, I wouldn't have done it. Oh, how many times that's been said. People in prison today, you go say, why are you here? Well, I did something while I was drinking. Got with the wrong crowd and I was drinking. Well, that's no excuse. That's no excuse you shouldn't have drank to start with. It'll mock you when your wife takes your children, walks out of your house and leaves you there in a drunken stupor. That liquor will, will haunt you. It'll mock you as you sit there in your broken home. Many of a good wife crying and weeping with a broken heart left a drunken husband because she couldn't take it anymore. And she didn't want her children to grow up among a drunk and thus she had to take them and leave. It'll mock you when your home's broken up. It'll mock you when your health is gone. A lot of people, they walk around staggering around in ill health because they weren't their stomach drinking alcoholic beverages. Multitudes are like that today. Some of you in the radio listening audience, if it is listening to me, maybe your wife's listening, you maybe you don't like what I'm saying and you don't want to listen to it. You're right there with a headache right now. And you went out last night and you drank and you you caroused around and, and you lived a, a terrible life of sin. And this morning you have a terrible headache and you and your wife probably uh, had a fuss this morning because of that. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Your home is going to be broke up. You're going to lose your children, end up in a drunken's grave and go to a drunken's hell. This preacher is talking to you and you better hear what I'm saying today. And, and don't turn that radio off. God's going to hold you responsible for what you hear this preacher saying. You can't get by it. You can't say, well, I won't listen to it. I won't be guilty. Yes, you are guilty. God's going to hold you responsible. If you're the head of your house, if you bring that stuff in your home, God's going to hold you responsible. And it's a shame today the way women are drinking. Used to be a time when very seldom you ever saw a woman drinking alcoholic beverages. Now you see women drunk, staggering around, sucking cigarettes and things of that type. Some of them on dope and living in a life of sin. It's a shame headed toward a drunkard's grave and a devil's hell. What did Jesus say about this drinking? Jesus tells us something about it in Matthew chapter 24. He said, don't eat and drink with the drunkards. In Luke chapter 21, he said, don't have any part out there with those drunkards out there uh, drinking and surfing and so forth. And the Apostle Paul has a lot to say, but the Holy Spirit forbids in Ephesians 5, 18, be not drunk on wine. Galatians chapter 5, verse 19 and 20, now the works of the flesh, the envy, murder, drunkenness. God warns us. God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11, keep no company with drunkards. Don't associate with them. The Bible says in Romans chapter 13, verse 13, it leads to routing and wantonness, the Bible tells us. It'll rot your kidneys. It'll put knots in your liver. It'll daze your brains. It'll give you a foul breath. It'll make you stagger to the gutter. It'll change you from a man to a beast. It'll cause you to abuse your best friends and loved ones. It'll cause you to curse God who gives you your life. It'll cause you to spend money for that which is not bread. It'll cause you to exchange the arms of a little baby into the arms of a harlot. It'll cause you to drive into the jaws of death. It'll send your soul to hell. And you need to give it up and never start it because it's a terrible thing. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, Know you not the unrighteous shall inherit the kingdom of God, neither drunkards nor covetous shall go in, God said. There is a drunken's grave where people go that drank themselves and go on and drink it until they die. A beautiful blonde in Philadelphia was about to be a bridesmaid on the next day. A man pulled out a butcher knife, struck the eight-inch blade in her body three times. When arrested, the only answer was, I was drinking. I was drinking. In the state of Florida, a head-on collision in the wreckage of a Bible. In the wreckage, there was a Bible in one car and a broken whiskey bottle in another. 
Let me say this in close. I have much I can say, but time will forbid. Many years ago, we heard a wreck out here in front of this church. Heard the noise. My wife and I went out. There's an old black truck had crossed over on the wrong side of the road. There came a man and woman this way, driving probably too fast. They hit that truck head on. I went out there to see if I could be in help. Be in help. You know what I saw? There lay that man with his head back, his eyes open, bleeding from his body. There lay that woman ahead and hit the windshield and the dashboard and burst out part of her brains. There they were dead. But wait a minute. They were sitting out there in front of that Jesus saved sign. And that sign was shining the light in their face. Jesus saves. Down in that floorboard and on the ground, there were whiskey bottles, beer bottles, wine bottles in that car where that man and woman was killed instantly. They were not married. They were living together, but they were not married. And they were drunk and they died. And they died with a Jesus saved sign shining the light in their eyes. Jesus saves. But probably died and went to hell. If you're wise, you won't touch that ungodly stuff. If you're wise, you'll say no. If you're a good husband, you won't allow it in your house. And you ought to take a guard against it like it was a rattlesnake. Because we're living in a drunken nation and headed to a drunken's hell and you don't want to go there and you need to do something about it. Let us all stand to our feet. Father in heaven, I pray today that you'll take this message and that you'll use it. God, we're living in a drunken nation. We don't know how much more longer you're going to bear with America. You've been so good to us. You've blessed us beyond measure. But our Father with the Murder of a million and a half unborn babies every year. And drunks on the highway killing people at the rate of 27,000 a year. And over 50,000 wrecks because of drunkenness. And all the alcohol and all the dope and so forth in this land and perversion. God, we don't know how much long you're going to spare us. We have a good nation. You've been good to America. But God the devil... The devil's trying to destroy our country, and the devil's trying to destroy our people. We pray that you'll use this message today to help us. In Christ's name, amen. David, play for us. If you're here and you need to get saved, come on down here. Let me help you to God. If you're here and you need to come back to God, here's the place to come back to God right here. If you're here and you want to join this church, we receive members, you come on. And we'll take that in consideration. If God is speaking, I want you to come.